Hello and welcome to yet another edition of What Works, What Doesn't and Why Insights from Evaluation. Today we will be discussing ID's recent evaluation, Knowledge Solutions for Development and Evaluation of ADB's Readiness for Strategy 2030. We'll have several other uh, very interesting evaluations coming up in 2021, some of them being the real-time evaluation for COVID-19, 1ADB, climate change, etc. But now back to the discussion today. Let me put the context to today's discussion in place right now. So the region ADB works in today is, you would agree, very different from when ADB was founded more than 50 years ago. Five decades ago, most countries of Asia and the Pacific were poor and faced significant liquidity constraints and had limited access to finance. Today, most ADB development member countries are middle income. So while external finance remains important, the region requires a newer model of external support. ADB Strategy 2030 identifies knowledge as a cornerstone of its value addition to strengthen its financings and partnerships. Um, last year, to support the implementation of ADB Strategy 2030, the Independent Evaluation Department completed an evaluation titled Knowledge Solutions for Development. In today's What Works, What Doesn't, and Why Insights from Evaluations, we will ask the question, is ADB ready to meet the new knowledge demands of its partners and to take us through a brief presentation of the key findings and recommendations of the report i'd like to invite eric blue who's the team leader of this evaluation eric over to you thank you thank you so much Salea. i'm really glad to be here with you all and uh get a chance to finally present present a little bit about our presentation to the adb we have five key messages so first while adb has has good capacity, uh, good knowledge capacity, is an, and is pursuing important reforms such as the uh, uh, such as K Map and the cultural transformation. Its current path will not make it ready to meet the knowledge goals as as articulated in um, in Strategy 2030. Now, two ADB's culture and business model focus heavily on cost effectiveness and on volume. That often reduces the, the, the space for knowledge sharing innovation and knowledge solution. Number three, re related to the above, ADB has strong silos, which effectively lead to internal competition for resources and limit collaboration and multidisciplinary teamworks, both within and between operation departments. Also, ADB's new, um, new results framework does have a greater focus on knowledge, but further work is needed to actually to measure knowledge management processes, as well as the impact of knowledge solutions. We, we think that ADB is, is at a crossroads. It, ha it has a strategic choice to make uh, as it looks forward, both um, uh, particularly after the pandemic, uh, does it wish to focus more on knowledge, uh, have that be its comparative advantage, or does it want to focus, or does it want to continue its focus on um, on low cost finance? Those are our key messages. I'm just quickly going to outline ADB's approach to knowledge and some of our main findings. First of all, it's important to know that ADB ADB has always seen going back to 1966. Uh, it's always seen um, knowledge as an important part of what it's offered. Um, the first president of the ADB um, in 1966 made reference to the famous family doctor approach and emphasized the importance of learning, not just, not just financing. Um, however, traditionally, ADB has separated knowledge from financing, from financing, creating this idea of the finance plus plus model. And um, I think re related to that, in recent years, we've seen a, a gradual but steady decline in real spending on um, KSTAs. Let me go now to the findings, which are built around the, um, the evaluation questions. So our first evaluation question deals with the identification of regional and country needs. So. Clearly, ADB has developed strong relations with governments and is seen as being a responsive partner. And I'm sure after the pandemic, if anything, our scores will go up 
in that area quite substantially. Generally, ADB doesn't have a strong relationship with other stakeholders. And frankly, DMCs generally don't see ADB as a leader in providing rapid and highly technical policy advice. Now, um, regarding how well ADB tailors its knowledge solutions. Um, ADB definitely has a strong reputation for efficiency and in the delivery of, of engineering solutions. ADB, as you know, has a, has a, um, a review system that focuses on compliance, um, very good at focusing on compliance, but it pays less attention to knowledge sharing and to technical quality. Of course, consultants play a major role in this organization. And while that you know, allows staff to multitask, it also brings risks and limitations in terms of co context specific and institution specific knowledge. Okay. Our third evaluation question deals with, with processes and culture. So in recent years, as you know, ADB has streamlined its business processes and this of course brings many advantages. It's always good to, to improve efficiency, but it does reduce the opportunities for analysis, for debate and collaboration. And speaking about collaboration, it can be quite limited by the silos and the hierarchies. Everybody in ADB has a place and that's where they're expected to do most of their, to do most of their work. Um, I'm talking specifically, of course, about the operations department. And then this is, of course, um, reinforced by the culture and the incentives, incentive system, which also focus on delivering quickly. Okay, on to our final evaluation question, the measurement and sharing of knowledge solutions. As you'd probably know, ADB has a new results framework that does place greater emphasis on institutional outcomes, not just on disbursement and physical measures. But it's still weak in measuring KM processes, knowledge management processes, and in measuring the impact of its knowledge solution. So sort of at the lower end of the results framework and at the higher end of the knowledge results framework, it's still a little weak. In recent years, we've uh, ADB has successfully expanded its communication um, footprint. And finally, um, technology is definitely providing new tools. I don't have to remind anybody of that. And the investments that um, ITB have, have made have been crucial in the past year. It still remains difficult to find internal resources and to find skills across the institution, whether that means a BTOR, a consultant report, or just who has, which staff member has skills in certain areas. It can be very challenging to do that and it usually involves several emails. Let me move on to the recommendations. Typically, as you know, IED makes um, recommendations. One, two, three, four, five. And you can accept them, you can reject them. But in this case, we decided to do it a little bit differently and offer um, sort of a menu, a decision. We, we think that ADB, as I said at the beginning, is at a crossroads. So it needs to make a high level decision about the depth and the scope of the transformation needed to implement strategy 2030's knowledge ambitions. And if ADB wishes to if management and the board and the bank wish to pursue what we call the knowledge plus plus bank, uh, that will require deep reforms of its culture, structure and HR management. And if ADB on the other hand, chooses to continue with the finance plus plus model, the current pace of reform can be uh, maintained. Although we do need to focus more on ensuring that knowledge crosses the boundaries. Regardless of its decision, ADB should take ownership of its choice and should develop uh, new knowledge tools, update its procedure and better measure knowledge solutions. I just wanna clarify that, that we're not saying that ADB should pursue knowledge plus plus in country A, but in country B, we should pursue finance plus plus. We are talking about ADB as an institution. The richest countries, 
still need financing. The poorer countries still need need knowledge. Uh, let's not let's not confuse the fact that countries need differentiated approach with the approach that we see ADB as an institution take. Um, we definitely do not think that there's a finance plus plus model for country A and a knowledge plus plus mo model for country B. Rather, the one ADB should choose what kind of model it wants to go pursue going forward. So thank you very much and on with the show. Thank you, Eric. Your presentation sets the stage, so to say, for today's discussion. Let me quickly introduce you to the panelists today. Uh, we have with us Roger Fisher, Executive Director, Board of Directors, Ahmed Saeed, Vice President, Operations 2, Susan Roth, Chief of Knowledge Advisory Service Center at STCC, and today's session will be moderated by Marvin Taylor Dotman. He is Director General at the Independent Evaluation Department. Marvin, it's over to you now. Thank you very much, Saleha. Uh, thank you very much to our uh, audience, colleagues. Thank you for joining us. And of course, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, we are talking today about one of uh, the most important subjects for the future of uh, ADB in our view uh, is a subject that will define the competitiveness of the institution going forward. And it's a subject that is not foreign, strange to ADB. As we just heard, it, the institution has been working on this for a number of years. And the point now is to make it happen and uh, to succeed in what has been attempted uh, in, uh, in, in different ways over the years. And we have uh, with us a fantastic panel to discuss the challenges uh, to make this true. Uh, and uh, so we are going to have a conversation in two parts for our audience. First, we're gonna try to understand what the issues are from their own uh, perspectives. And then we're gonna try to uh, understand their views on what has to be done going forward. Let's start our conversation uh, with Susan. Uh, Susan, you have been at the forefront uh, uh, working on this subject for um, a, quite a while already in, in shaping uh, the KMAT, the Knowledge Action Plan of the institution. Uh, so can you please tell us what in your view are the key issues that the institution has to uh, overcome uh, to be able to produce uh, a good knowledge solutions, valuable for uh, the country, valuable for uh, the private sector uh, clients uh, of uh, the institution. And tell us if this notion that we've been talking about over and over one ADB makes any sense here uh, for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marvin. It's a, it's a delight to be here today um, and, and speak um, um, from my passion uh, about knowledge management. So there's there are several aspects. I think ID did a fantastic job identifying some of these key constraints and also putting the issue on the table of what we want to be. If we look now at the gaps, we can basically divide them into structural gaps, the technology gaps, the process gaps, and the culture gaps. When we put all of this together, and I, I love to share the, the KMAP presentation with everybody, I'll drop that later in the chat box, we can say there are five key issues. Number one issue is ADB is very good with counting. So we looked at the number of knowledge products and services over the last years more than actually looking at the impact and what strategic purpose the knowledge work has on our business development, also on the quality of the portfolio, and also on creating demand for certain products that ADB can offer. And I want to put clean and green and climate there at the forefront of everything. The second, obviously, are the silos. And silos are good in organizations and in bureaucracies because you get things done. But you also need to have good reasons to cross the silos and we have to create these reasons and that's i think where 180b come bank-wide initiatives bank-wide topics 
the long other times gone that we work in sectors and themes, we work on issues, on complex development issues. COVID is an example that um, it's not a virus that caused the pandemic, but underlying big systems and, um, and, and complex issues, and, and they have to be tackled. And the third one is really, we have to look at quality more than quantity, and we have to have better processes to challenge the quality. I, I love the, the quote of let a thousand uh, fly hours bloom, but um, let's make sure one or two of them are really of high quality. And the fourth one is the understanding of what a country team is. A country team is not just the team in a resolution. A country team is everybody who works on a country. And we need to make sure these teams are well organized. It cannot be that we have 90 team leaders for various initiatives in one country, which currently we have. And it cannot be that our country directors don't know what the knowledge portfolio is in their countries and that around 25% has nothing to do with lending, not with current, not with future. So there it comes to strategy. And the fifth one is really the learning organization, which is something every private sector organization is looking at right now. How do we use the data we generate? How do we learn for efficiency, for innovation, for quality? And these are the five things you want to address with a K-Map. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Um, now, uh, let, let's take now a, a purely operational uh, perspective uh, to see how this that uh, Susan had said uh, resonate. Uh, VP uh, Said, uh, you have a, uh, an interesting blend of experience. Uh, you have been working both on the private sector, the financial sector, and also in the public sector. And so you can see uh, the needs uh, of uh, the clients uh, from both uh, perfect, uh, perspective before coming here. Can you uh, tell us in, in your own uh, view, what do you think that needs to be changed in the institution uh, for the institution to uh, improve its value proposition in the area of knowledge? And, and, and what do you think that ADB can learn from the private sector uh, in incorporating knowledge uh, into the value that it offers to its clients? Thank you, uh, Marvin. Uh, thank you uh, to our IAD colleague, colleagues and my co-panelists. Um, thank you, Suzanne, obviously, for the incredibly important work you're doing uh, on, on making knowledge central to our work here at ADB. I'm going to start, Marvin, by answering the question, um, what can we learn from uh, the private sector? Um, and, and as you noted, I, I've had the opportunity to be on both sides. Um, and, and there's many things, but I'll just emphasize one. The single most important thing that I learned about our power at the ADB from the private sector is something that if you have not been in the private sector, you may not fully appreciate, which is the power of trust. Um, when, when you are in a private sector entity and you have an idea which you are convinced is in the interests of your clients, you still have to overcome a trust gap. And that trust gap is there for good reasons. I think we at the ADB need to understand how powerful it is, how incredibly powerful it is to be trusted. Um, and, and I would say that this is the single biggest lesson for me. Um, we are trusted and because we are trusted, um, if we weaponize our institution, our knowledge assets, we can have incredible impact. Um, so, so that's how I would answer the first question in terms of what I've learned, although one could also elaborate in other ways. Um, just to answer the broader question of, of, and briefly on how can ADB boost its value proposition through knowledge. Um, it was 25 years ago uh, that Jim Wolfenson wrote his famous memo uh, at the World Bank Group calling for the redefinition of that institution as a knowledge bank two and a half decades. Um, and so there's no question that knowledge is central to the development enterprise here as we sit in 2021. Um, I'm gonna offer, because I think uh, the KMAP has done a good job at the operational level of, of talking about the constraints in the existing organization. I'm just gonna offer a bit of a higher level comment on what I view as sort of three key themes that need to be present in our knowledge work, three key types of knowledge product we need to have as an institution. Number one, we need to be an institution that provides thought leadership, cutting edge thought leadership. Um, and we have to understand if we're going to do that, that it cannot be a consensus culture, 
Um, it is a culture of debate and you don't have to be right to help us make progress towards truth. Um, I think it is underappreciated the extent to which in the social sciences we learn by doing. We learn by putting ideas out, falsification, engagement, they don't have to be perfect. We need to be willing to do cutting edge thinking that may not be connected to near term problems, near term policy solutions, but we've got to be able to do it. We've got to be willing to be controversial. We've got to be willing to be cutting edge. We've got to be willing to be wrong. So I think that's one thing we need in our knowledge products. The second thing, which I think we do very well, although we can, we can do more, is the second type of knowledge product to me is deeply connected to policy action. I think our recent work in the context of COVID-19 response across the region um, in OG1 and in OG2, there's a number of examples where there was demand, very complex interdisciplinary um, set of policy issues of first impression, and we assembled the resources, we assembled the experts, we provided, we provided input, and we led directly to policy action. Um, more can be said about what we should be doing around providing specific policy inputs to near-term problems, everything from development strategy uh, to how do you identify uh, needy for social assistance programs and, and, and the entire universe of space in between, but I'll just highlight that as the second area. The third area, I think, which is critical as it relates to our knowledge product, and again, I would say this is one that we can be doing a lot more, is we have to weaponize knowledge. And what do I mean by that? We have, to, and we have to be in the business of creating platforms that drive outcomes by leveraging knowledge at our disposal. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about this when we talk about what we're doing. Um, but in OG2 this year, we have a few different platforms we're gonna be trying to create, um, which try to bring a coalition of actors together around creating solutions to problems of common interest, of development interests, of regional public goods. At the heart of these platforms is knowledge insight, um, but, it, but we marry that knowledge insight to the intangible assets of this institution, its trust, its convening authority, its reach, its ability to bring together actors who don't trust each other. And so I'd highlight these three areas, I think, which I think about a lot when I think about our knowledge work. You know, Number one, we've gotta be a cutting edge, set of cutting edge thinkers. Number two, we have to provide specific policy insight. And number three, we have to take it upon ourselves sometimes to create platforms that deliver solutions, leveraging policy insights or knowledge that we have. So, so let me just pause there, but, uh, but I think obviously an incredibly important uh, topic for the future of this institution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, VP uh, Saeed. Let us now uh, take the angle of uh, the board. Uh, I know that... Uh, Edi Fisher is not representing the board as a whole, but, uh, but he brings this perspective of uh, the board. So yes, there is an action plan. Um, yes, there is an evaluation and different perspective in the institution. But uh, more importantly, there is an expectation uh, by the board and an approved uh, a, a strategic plan uh, going forward uh, by, by the board, Strategy 2030, which places knowledge at the center stage. And so, Iri Fisher, can you give us your, your, your perspective of uh, uh, where do you think the bank is falling short uh, in delivering the expectations of, uh, of the board uh, and where it is actually doing good? And uh, the bank has to reinforce these areas uh, going forward. It's my pleasure to join you all in this important discussion and thank you Marvin and colleagues for uh, organizing this and bringing us together. What I want to do uh, just now is uh, one, uh, say something about the premise of our discussion and then uh, just point to three strong points and three challenges in, in ADB. On the premise, I don't think that client satis satisfaction can be the only measure of success, uh, and I say this because of two reasons. One, um, I want to see ADB as an innovator. And the definition of innovation is beforehand, you don't know what it is. So that there can't be any demand. Second, I believe uh, ADB has a mission in regional public goods. And the definition of public goods is uh, there's no specific demands uh, uh, you find uh, with a specific client. So I, I would challenge us all to 
uh, have this broader view. Three uh, strong points. Um, I'm really impressed by uh, the knowledge side of our COVID response. And uh, I think it uh, really would pay to have a closer look at what enabled us to, uh, to have this, this response. Uh, the obvious thing is we, uh, ADB was far-sighted enough to hire Suzanne and Patrick and, and many others. Um, ADB was flexible enough to mobilize and, and bring to use uh, lots of new knowledge resources. And ADB was also fast uh, to bring something like the uh, COVID policy response database to, to the table. So I think uh, this is a good example we can, can learn uh, from because it was, it was fast, it was flexible, uh, and it still is, and it adds value. Uh, and the third strong points are really related to uh, what uh, Ahmed Saeed mentioned. It's about trust. I see uh, the family doctor ADB as a relationship banker. I see ADB as someone who has privileged access to uh, clients' knowledge. And I see ADB as having a very strong competence in building and expanding partnerships. And these are resources we, we uh, must use. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with, with the word uh, weaponizing, but um, definitely we, we should use these the strengths, access to privilege, access to uh, clients' knowledge and uh, our ability to build and nurture partnerships. On uh, the challenges, I don't want to repeat uh, what I found out about silos, about intensive incentives, about the issue uh, of uh, knowledge retention when uh, knowledge is generated by consultants, etc. Uh, it is an issue we all know we have to work on. Second, probably more important thing is uh, how do we make sure that uh, we produce the useful knowledge? Um, I said before that uh, knowledge doesn't have to be useful at the outset, but we need to have an integrated look. Right now, I see too many uh, knowledge products and knowledge plans that uh, feel like an add-on to, to the actual CPS. And we need to be thinking about uh, how do we produce knowledge with a view of the concrete partner situation so that our knowledge products really become relevant uh, to country program. So relevance is an important thing. And the final thing is uh, really close to what Ahmed said, said about uh, thought leadership. Uh, I agree, we should be thought leaders, but you can't be a thought leader on everything. And that means focus. That means choice. That means saying no to, to certain demands. And I think uh, if we engage in, in that journey and look for where uh, the ADB can develop in, into someone best in class, we, we will get somewhere, but we uh, only uh, engage in that journey if uh, we uh, make a choice and say, uh, this is the kind of knowledge we draw from others, we may outsource, and this is a different kind of knowledge uh, where we really aim uh, for developing ourselves into thought leaders. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Iri Fischer. We have built uh, uh, a, a picture of uh, the areas that the institution has to work on, key areas, develop trust, as has been said, cutting edge uh, knowledge selectivity, thought leadership, innovation. All of this sounds uh, fantastic. And uh, we know uh, where it is hurting and where uh, the institution has to uh, do better. Uh, and where the institution is doing good um, as well. Uh, but let's put this now into specific uh, context. And let's talk about what is on the table to be done and what the expectations are from what has been done, the concrete uh, knowledge action plan. So Susan, uh, 
what exactly is being proposed by the Knowledge Action Plan to uh, address these issues and these expectations that have been mentioned by Iri Fisher and by VP uh, Said, and, and, and what is different from different from previous effort that we said the bank is not new to this, it's been doing this uh, for years, what's different? Mm -hmm. And, and what, why should we expect success this time as opposed to previous times? Mm -hmm. Okay, great questions. So the first, I'll start with the first one, and this is why we're going to be successful this time. And um, there are two reasons for us. We have to, because there is now a real business need. Okay, the large uh, finance envelope um, uh, is getting smaller that we have. We have to have knowledge and attract co-financing. We have to be better at marketing what we do. So we have to be also focusing, if we need to focus on all the stuff we are doing really well. The number, the second one is our um, developing member countries want to have this from us. They are asking for our support for high level policy dialogue to change um, demand for certain investments and policies which are required because we have the biggest uh, the biggest crisis in front of us, or we are in the middle of it, and this is the climate crisis. Um, there was just some research coming out, which has now proven that um, COVID is the result also of temperature increase. Uh, this kind of coronavirus hasn't been able to survive in this climate in South China before. So I think these are the two real reasons why we, we will be successful, because we have to be successful. There's a business need. So what do we do differently this time? Number one, we are debunking the myth about knowledge management. Knowledge management is part of organizational maturity. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. There is no uh, silver bullet which will fix all the issues. What we have to do is bring all of it together, have a good business reason, and align our business processes to the client needs. And this is, and I, I really like what Edie Fisher said, this is where the complete change in our country knowledge um, uh, programming and country knowledge um, uh, yeah, uh, programming actually comes in and we are now changing the way we do um, this knowledge work. We are looking at how knowledge drives the portfolio and how um, we have three kinds of knowledge work. One is to have high level policy dialogue, dialogue on certain strategic areas. The other one is how do we enhance the quality of the portfolio and that's the delivery and implementation science. And the last area is um, really on new business development. And obviously, and as E.D. Fisher said, we can't do it all. So that's really the challenge. We see the strategy 2030, and that was the challenge in the last couple of years, where we have a whole menu of options, which make a strategic approach even more difficult. And I think that's the skill, that's the human skill we need in our staff. And that's more than artificial intelligence and more than machine learning and more than interpreting data. That is understanding political economy, it's understanding the knowledge environment in the country, understanding what are the partners doing and where do we have the biggest impact on sustainable development in our countries. And what was also required is foresight. And that is a new discipline that we are introducing in the bank. All of this has to be supplemented by a culture change. And I love here what uh, Ye said as a comment, the technical expertise sits with the lower levels, but we don't celebrate them enough. So number one, that's what we need to do. We need to have this debate. Number two is the business process, which has to move from you know, the compliance to the quality. There has to be a competition. It has to be a competition. Otherwise we're not gonna improve quality and there has to be a valuable peer review process. And the third part is really, and Edie Fisher said it too, we need to use our partners. We need to be that relationship manager for our um, clients um, and, and for ourselves. There's lots of knowledge that sits out, outside. We have to be the curator, the filters, and um, the tailors of the knowledge that is required to address the, the, the challenges we all have uh, in, in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's... Uh... Stated like that, we have to succeed as an institution uh, this time. Uh, but uh, uh, VP Said cannot uh, just uh, stay with that uh, expectation. You have clients to serve. Um, and, you, and you have a, 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 a set of uh, clients that is it's, uh, interesting, the composition of this client from, from China, uh, the largest uh, uh, 
uh, client of, uh, of the institution from many dimensions to the smallest ones, the Pacific, huge diversity of, uh, of needs. Uh, what, what exactly would you expect that the knowledge action plan delivers uh, for you and more importantly for your clients? What areas are you prepared to push forward that, uh, that uh, serve the interest uh, of uh, your client uh, going forward? There, there are a number of uh, questions, by the way, to the uh, panel, panelists that uh, have been posed there. Uh, Susan addressed one of them already, uh, that if you can please uh, take into account uh, when, you, when you intervene on the role of a risk taking in the institution and the acceptance of error uh, or acceptance of a failure uh, in the institution. And also the role, uh, in your case uh, as well, VP uh, Said, the role of uh, uh, RMs in the integration with the knowledge part of a, uh, of a sector work, uh, for instance, of the institution. Over to you, VP Said. Thank you, Marvin. Um, look, I think that there's a lot um, there, there, there's a lot uh, within uh, KMAP that we're going to need to focus on delivering. Um, and, and I would certainly um, agree with you that uh, we have an incredibly diverse region, um, whether it's in OG2 or, or in OG1, but uh, it's incredibly uh, the ADB's uh, DMCs represent um, in, in a remarkably broad array of countries and a remarkably broad array, array of challenges. Um, and so I think, you know, if I, if I look at the KMAP initiatives, um, the third one, relationships built and nurtured, um, uh, you know, I think this is going to be absolutely critical because uh, responding to diverse client needs, of course, begins with understanding those clients. Um, you talked about the role of resident missions. Um, I think uh, that's highlighted in, in, in KMAP as well. And I do think that uh, we were already on a trajectory for resident missions to become more central uh, to our work. Uh, that has certainly been accelerated uh, by the onset of, of COVID-19 um, and a world within which travel uh, we can expect will remain significantly curtailed, um, certainly in, in DMCs, um, I would think for a minimum of another year or so. So I think one aspect of, uh, of KMAP initiatives that we will be very focused on um, is those focused on um, nurturing relationships externally and internally, um, centralizing responsibility to some extent amongst resident missions who are best positioned to understand their clients. Um, I think, you know, we also uh, will need to focus very much on process and systems, uh, which again is one of the key KMAP initiatives. So, you know, strengthening our country knowledge programming, um, strengthening and clarifying measures to guide teams in developing quality products, uh, Suzanne noted that we do a bit too much quantity and not enough quality assessment. We're going to need better tools uh, to determine impact. And then the third one, I think that we'll be very focused on, um, is improving people and culture. Uh, and you know, this is not easy. Um, and what I do want to highlight on this uh, is, or perhaps, perhaps a better way to put it is to offer a word of caution. Um, not that I think KMAP will not be successful. I think it certainly, it, it, will, it will take significant effort, um, but it's certainly possible that uh, it can be successful. Um, what I would emphasize, however, is that even if we are successful against delivering against um, this uh, plan, we may be well short uh, of our potential as an organization. Um, you know, you asked, you mentioned sort of my career experience, um, and I've had an opportunity to work in many large organizations, uh, ADB, the U.S. government, J.P. Morgan. I've never seen a large organization that achieved its full potential. And so one of the questions that we need to ask as we go along this journey of implementing KMAP is what are the constra other constraints, um, our people, our organizational structure, our culture, um, and to what extent uh, can we be even more ambitious uh, in terms of development impact. Uh, and I will not use again, uh, E.D. Fisher, uh, the W word, uh, but, uh, but I'll find some replacement. But to what extent can we get you know, even greater impact through our knowledge uh, if, we were to, if we were to loosen some of these other binding constraints um, that I do think limit us uh, in some ways as an organization. Um, and I think to, to, to be successful in doing that, 
we're going to need to not just talk about what's possible, but actually have you know demonstration projects that show you know what's possible um, if you know if we really start to start to strive uh, for greater impact. Um, maybe I can just uh, pause right there and, and hand it back to you, Mark. Thank thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, in, in, let me now go back to Edie Fisher and uh, in look at again at the specific solutions that are on the table to the issues that uh, we discussed at the, at the very beginning. Uh, you have actually been uh, working uh, quite actively in the development of the action plan management engaged the board um, it, it, from, from the beginning. And what do you think of what is there uh, stated in the action plan? Um, if, you spoke about selectivity. You cannot the bank cannot be the best in everything and cannot address everything at the same time? What priorities do you think uh, have to be uh, made? Uh, in in uh, a, what about the point that uh, Eric uh, stated at the very beginning about the strategic stance that uh, is expected of the institution, strategic stance has to come from the board right? uh, on knowledge. Has the bank stated a strong enough strategic stance on where it wants to be five years uh, from today in the area of knowledge? I would like to answer the question in terms of sequencing. We have we are solved some problems uh, in drafting the KMAD. There are many issues that the KMAD uh, already tackles. And there's a way to go in, in the future. And uh, my rough sense is uh, the, the things we have achieved in, in the KMAD is, uh, at the very least, we have identified the issues. Um, and we have brought together different expectations, different views, uh, all the factors that uh, really decide uh, upon our success. And I want to mention that in this process, I found uh, the deep dive we had together with the board very, very useful uh, because uh, it really brought us all together and forced each one of us to, uh, to consider uh, the expectations, the opinions, uh, and the knowledge actually of, of other um, stakeholders. Uh, I don't know so much about uh, the process inside uh, staff, but I'm sure um, that similar processes have happened there. And uh, uh, this is why I would say uh, we now have all the tools in play. We now um, have a pretty good picture of uh, the, the obstacles we have to face and the, the broad directions we, we must take. But there are some important unanswered questions yet. Um, uh, in, in a way, um, to put it a little harshly, um, there are some strategies and um, policy papers in ADB where uh, you only know the real meaning of those policy papers once you read uh, the next uh, work program and budget framework. So, this really applies to came up also. I think what came up really means uh, will be decided in in the next and um, the the cyclical process of the work program budget framework, because it will uh, contain answers to two questions. One, uh, do we focus? Where will our focus be? And two, uh, where will we uh, where will we put our resources? It's obvious that um, came up success de depend on, on those questions. And I'm looking forward to, to the conversation uh, about those, those two questions to make it relevant. Thank you. Absolutely, That's, uh, that it is clear, put your money where your mouth is, is the, is the principle, right? Um, and it will be uh, a, up to management to request the resources that are needed 
as we say in the evaluation, this proposition is not uh, is not budget neutral and up to management to bring these pro these proposals and, and and to the board to commit truly commit to allocate the resources to um, a, address the issues that you have been talking about uh, and implement the solutions that the action plan states. There are a number of questions that uh, that our, our our audience have been posing there. Uh, one question is about the role of RMs. Uh, right, this is not a this is it's not a, a an issue of uh, HQ. It's not Manila. Is the challenge is how to integrate uh, the regional offices uh, as well. There is uh, a, a, a review of uh, the role of uh, a RMs in the institution. Uh, how is this connected? If uh, any of uh, the, the panelists can talk about this. Uh, there is also uh, a question uh, that I refer to on, on uh, the two are related. The, the, the role of knowledge and quality. Uh, several of you have uh, stated uh, the expectation that this will improve the quality of uh, uh, of uh, products of the institution. How does that work? Uh, the role of knowledge and quality of the institution. And, uh, and, and finally, there is a, a, a question on the attitude of the institutions toward uh, failure. Um, does this mean that by bringing in more uh, knowledge, the institution will also change its stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, risk-taking Knowledge, uh, as uh, Iri Fisher said, it means innovation. Means innovation means taking risk as well. What do you think the uh, the stance of the institution should be? You know, in in uh, diplomatic service, uh, an ambassador uh, is a representative of the entire state um, from which uh, he or she comes. Um, they represent the entirety of government, not uh, the foreign ministry or, or the State Department, certainly in the US system. I'm not familiar with others. Um, the role of resident uh, missions, and, and in particular of those who lead them, uh, in an ADB context is not at all dissimilar. Um, while uh, in most cases they have may have matured um, and, and done the bulk of their, their work in operations, um, perhaps had spent time in centralized function functions like SPD or SDCC, it's absolutely critical um, in conducting their responsibilities that they think of themselves uh, as representatives of the entire institution, um, whether that is non-sovereign operations, whether that's SDCC, whether that's ERCD, um, they have to take on the responsibility of being holistic thinkers about their clients' problems and about the tools available inside our institution to address them. Um, you know, I think Sometimes we, we worry uh, more than I think perhaps we should uh, about delivering on our uh, lending targets. Uh, if we have been able to deliver on our targets through an era of QE um, and flush liquidity in emerging markets, believe me, uh, there will be demand uh, for our inexpensive capital in the coming years. Um, so we have to set our sights higher. And it begins with, and, and I saw Veronique had a question about political economy. It really begins with asking, what are the problems that our DMCs have that we are best positioned to help them address as an institution? Selectivity is absolutely a part of it. We can't be all things to all people. Um, you know, For example, domestic resource mobilization is clearly a space where this institution under the leadership of the current president is going to be a leader. Um, uh, and, and that's an example of a place we should proactively be thinking about. Um, you know, where can we help address these problems? Because the resources and the expertise will be there. There are other examples as well. Um, but let me pause there on the resident mission topic um, and perhaps the other panelists have some thoughts as well. I said, thank you very much, Ipi Said. Let me turn, me turn it over to Susan for your reactions. Yeah, um, I would say all three come together because you need to have this goes good understanding of the country context, and we do have that, and we need to value our national officers there a lot more and, and listen. And I think build also the relationships with the local think tanks. There are several examples, for example, Indonesia 
has uh, organized something like an advisory group of civil society and think tanks to get this intelligence. Um, and, and that will then enhance our quality. And if we have better quality, then we can also allow better for failure. I think this whole failure discussion is, um, is, is difficult because we are not a startup. Um, and if you say this, you know, fail fast and fail often, that's not necessarily what we should do. We have the responsibility of taxpayers' money. So when we fail, there have to be good reasons. And, um, and we have to have a process in place to um, review faster why we would fail and what doesn't work well. And that brings us back again to the issue of the learning organization. I mean, what you're doing already in ID now, real-time evaluations, faster feeding back of what works, what doesn't. And this needs to be then the dialogue that, um, that is required. So it's a lot more about conversations, dialogue, not only technical, but also in terms of the country context and um, really pushing for high quality that then allows uh, for, for failure. Um, Iri Fischer, yes, please. Thank you. Um, a few words uh, on, on quality. Um, maybe I'm stating the obvious. I think uh, uh, quality presupposes three things, resources, selectivity, and a clear picture mm -hmm. of division of labor. Um, obviously, a large part of the con conversation uh, among development partners is uh, IMF is better at ADB in issues A, B, and C. And I think uh, when we make the choice, where do we want to be a, a thought leader, we need to consider uh, where the strength and maybe weaknesses uh, of others are and where we, we fit in. Uh, speaking of uh, DRM, um, I agree, um, ADB has strengths now and it can build on those strengths and expand those. Uh, but we also know that uh, IMF, World Bank, OECD are in this game also. And uh, uh, that's why I think uh, it takes uh, some, some uh, effort probably to find our, our niche, uh, even in, in the uh, DRM space. Um, on, on risk, I think uh, obviously, uh, given that, uh, that the board uh, is an oversight body, uh, we, by mandate, we have to take a cautious approach on, on risk. But we still, and at and, and this point, I think I can speak for, for the entire board, we understand that we are in, in the development business and that development business entails risks. I think uh, the important thing about um, managing risks is transparency. Uh, if everyone is clear at the outset uh, what we're in for, what might happen, if we share the, those responsibilities and if we give the board uh, the opportunity to, to, to make that call and say, now uh, we know things can happen, but, but we still make that, that decision to go forward. Uh, then uh, to take up uh, Saeed's, uh, Ahmed Saeed's word, trust uh, is, is the one most single most important driver, the kind of risk attitude we, we need. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, there are many other issues that uh, we can we can uh, talk about uh, in this uh, journey. Uh, I would ask if uh, the panelists would like would like to have a final final reflection, um, a short reflection, uh, and a key message that you would like to leave with our with our audience uh, before we close. But I'd like to invite everyone to consider themselves as knowledge workers. This is what we do. Um, I also like to invite everyone to consider the role of knowledge focus. This will be a very instrumental role in every department. I'd also like to say that having knowledge is not at all what is important. It is how we apply it well and how do we apply it well in the interest of all our member countries. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Ahmed? Uh, just very quickly, I would say that uh, a knowledge worker is a solution provider. Uh, and so we have to think of ourselves as uh, people uh, who identify problems, um, who identify solutions, um, and who have the tools at their disposal to, to attack 
the problems of political economy uh, that often sit between uh, problems and effective solutions. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Iri Fischer. Thank you. I think this is a point where I have to say yes and. Uh, obviously, uh, we are about solutions and we want to use knowledge uh, that eventually we solve problems. Uh, but we know that uh, the connection between uh, knowledge produced and solutions um, produced is, is not always straightforward, not always um, uh, very direct. So I think uh, to get to the quality we need, we also uh, need to create space uh, for a little bit of free thinking and experimentation, etc. Thank you very much. Our time is up. Uh, there are again as a, a number of uh, a additional issues that we could uh, address and continue talking about. Uh, the audience has uh, continued posing uh, uh, questions uh, and, and, and comments. Uh, the role of consultants, for instance, uh, one key issue that uh, that we talk about in the evaluation. Uh, uh, they, 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 they need to be operationally um, a, a relevant and at the same time uh, embark in innovation, uh, the role of silos, uh, how we tackle this. There are a number of issues that we have there uh, pending and uh, we could continue talking about. Please send your questions to the panelists and for sure send your questions to to Eric, we would be very happy uh, to answer your questions um, and exchange with all of you. As the panelists have said, this is the work of everyone. Uh, everyone has to be engaged in transforming the institution, it's not the leadership uh, only. Um, the expectations are high uh, from ourselves and from uh, the point of view of uh, the clients. Uh, and I pick up a number of words that the panelists have uh, delivered uh, during this exchange. The institution has to succeed this time. The institution has to be a thought leader. There has to be selectivity. There has to be allocation of uh, resources uh, to make this a reality and not leave this in simply a set of, a, of a plans, uh, dreams, or papers. Uh, for the future of the institution, we expect that all of this uh, uh, come true. Uh, uh, as has been said in other the fora, uh, it is not a process that will come to a conclusion next year. It's a journey that the institution is uh, starting today and let's hope that in five years, when we evaluate again the institution on where it is with respect to knowledge, we see a very different picture and an institution being absolutely uh, competitive in uh, Asia and the world in this uh, area. Thank you very much to the panelists. Congratulations to all of you. And thank you very much to our STEAM audience colleagues that have been uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, a good number of them. Have all of you a great day. Thank you.